Okay, hello everyone. This is David Fisher from Immigration Chambers. Today we have a very special guest. We're going to be um, have a bit of having a question and answer with Vanessa Cortez from Gentium in Montreal. Vanessa is an immigration specialist of Canadian laws. Um, hi Vanessa, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm very good and yourself? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a cold and brisk Tuesday morning here in New Zealand. Um, and, and I gather um, it's quite hot over there in Canada at the moment. It's, so I'm in Montreal right now and it's, it's pretty hot. We're at uh, 32 degrees right now. So it's pretty hot. Wow, 32 degrees. Sometimes we forget um, the polar opposites of, of where we are. So look, um, today, Vanessa, I just wanted to, um, to go through a few, few questions that some of my clients have got here in New Zealand about um, Canada and Canadian immigration. And, and you seem like uh, a good person to talk to about this. Um, so your, your company is based in Montreal and you guys are immigration specialists, much like us, is that correct? Correct, so we're in Montreal. We have uh, another branch in Trois-Rivières, so it's another city in Quebec. Okay. And uh, we are specialists in Canadian immigration and we also do Quebec immigration. So you, in, in Canada, you have to have a specific license for Quebec because Quebec has oh, really? its special rules. So we are, we're allowed to work with Quebec and everyone else outside of Quebec as well. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you're licensed for Canada, but you also have to be specially licensed for that region of, of Quebec. Is that because of the, um, the language differences um, with the French versus English? Uh, it's mostly his history. It's because mm -hmm. Quebec has wanted to separate from Canada for many, many years. Right. And, uh, it's gotten to a point that they've gotten a little bit of independence and that has taken over the part of immigration. So they have their own immigration system and they want to be able to control who gets into their province. So when it comes to Quebec, they say the first yes. And then Canada says the federal yes, which is of course you become a Canadian resident and a Canadian citizen, but Quebec has to allow you or select you first to become a part of the Quebec society. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. It, I, I suppose that doesn't mean, though, that other Canadians need a visa to go to Quebec. No, no. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, anything. A little bit of a unique quirk. Um, hey, so the, the, the first and, and I guess most topical thing to talk about is, is COVID-19 and, and border closures. So, you know, here we are on the 28th of July, 2020. Um, here in New Zealand, we, we don't have much of a COVID problem um, as we might have had we not closed our border. Um, the, but the result of that is, yeah, the border is closed. Um, there aren't really planes coming in and out of New Zealand. We're, you know, we're an island nation and we can, we can do that and it's quite easy. But how, how is it over in Canada? Um, uh, is there free movement of people? Are you guys experiencing lockdown? Uh, so we're not on lockdown anymore. We, we were for a few months here in Quebec and across Canada. So it started, uh, different provinces open up in different stages and different times. Uh, when it comes to the border, it's still closed. Uh, we're not allowing people in until they're, they're saying they moved it again to the 31st of August. It was the 21st of July. Okay. So we're not sure it might be extended again. Now, that does not mean that nobody gets in. Uh, people who are essential services or, let's say, truck drivers, and they have right. to work in the U.S. and Canada, they're, still, uh, they're able to come in. I they see. don't have to respect the 14-day quarantine either. So it, it okay. depends who you are, uh, and we're, Canada is really focused on getting all Canadians back in Canada. So a lot of our people are stranded ab abroad, and they're trying to really push to get these people back. And um, so yeah, it, when it comes to the border, it depends who you are and where you're coming to in the country if you can come in. If you're an essential service, and a lot of uh, jobs are going to health, uh, you know, the health uh, sector. And in that case, if you get a work permit with the health sector. I mean that you're you're coming in. Okay, sounds quite subject, similar to here. Yeah, but then you're subject to the 14-day quarantine. 14-day quarantine, yeah, of course. And so, so that means then applications for visas are still open. We can still submit an application for a visa to Canada, but it'll it'll only be processed and approved if uh, you are in an essential service. No, so. Yes, to, yes, you can apply at any time uh, for any type of visas. For a short period of time, they were not accepting or just very lightly telling people not to apply for a visitor visa because they were not being processed. But everything else being processed as usual. The only difference okay. is that they won't be able to come in the country. 
So let's say if I want to study in Canada, I can apply and let's say I want to study in September, that's fine. You can do the whole application, not an issue. But if you do get accepted to your program and to your study visa, then you start work or you start studying from wherever you are. A right. lot of colleges, if not all, and universities right now are online in Canada. So you can start right. studying from abroad. That's fine, no problem. When the border opens, you can come in. I see. Okay. Yeah, see here in New Zealand, they've taken the approach of um, basically just stopping all processing of offshore applications. And the rationale behind that is that um, look, if the border is closed and you can't come in, it wouldn't be right for us to give you a visa. Okay. Yeah. Um, however, with, yeah, the, with the students, that's quite interesting. It's, yeah, it's handled very different. And, and the government in Canada has been very flexible. And every time we hear news as immigration consultants and lawyers, we're very happy because they really allow us to work and they allow people to have opportunities. So for instance, when it comes to uh, having a, a work permit after you graduate, usually you're not allowed to do any online courses. But now because of the pandemic, uh, the government has said, well, forget that. We're gonna allow you to 50% of the time uh, online, that's fine, okay. and outside of the country. And it's not gonna affect your work permit and it's not gonna affect your permanent residency application okay. at all. Oh, that's so great. They, things like that to really make it easy for for those who want to come into Canada. That's great. So, so what you're saying is the government has been quite proactive in amending the policies um, to suit the, the time. Oh, that's exactly. great. Yeah, no, they've been a bit slow here on that one. We have, we have a number of people who um, have found themselves either stranded offshore or um, who have started studying while offshore. And when, when we ask immigration, okay, well, look, is this going to affect their eligibility for their post-study work visa? And the answer is yes, it will, because the policy itself says you have to be in New Zealand. And so they just haven't amended that yet. Um, although, um, you know, maybe something will come. We're in the middle of an election year. And, and we've also been subject to a little bit of a scandal with our immigration minister in this last um, seven days. So we're hoping that things will change a little bit um, in the coming weeks. Um, okay, so on that point about applications and, and who can apply and, and um, you know, what's available, um, we, we get this question all the time about Canada um, with uh, express entry and, and something called PNP. Can you maybe just explain a little bit about what PNP is and, and what express entry is? Of course. So express entry is a, it's a, an immigration system. It's not a program itself. So people sometimes sometimes people say, oh, well, I'm going to apply to Express Entry. Well, that's not an actual program. Okay. It's a, it's a selection system that allows people to get selected through different programs like a skilled worker, semi skilled worker, or career in trade. So that system is based on a point-based system. So that right. means that the more points that you have, the more chances you get to be selected as a... As a um, okay, so points for experience, qualifications, uh, maybe language ability, age. So we have age for sure. Uh, after 35 years of age, you start losing points. Uh, yep. You got languages, so it's English or French or both. If you have both, you have the jackpot. Extra yeah, points. Amazing points. Uh, education, so if you usually a master's degree is the most, uh, if you're outside the country and you don't have any Canadian experience, if you have a master's degree, that's more likely for express entry. Okay. Uh, if you worked in the last 10 years, it has to be a minimum of one, one year of experience uh, that's qualified experience. So it has to be management positions or professional or trade positions. It right. So there is, a, there is a level of skill that's required to be able to claim experience. Correct. Exactly. So you have to prove uh, at least one year. The minimum minimum is one year. Okay. I uh, see. And for the language, for the IELTS exam, people ask that question all the time. Uh, it's going to be a minimum of six per category. So it's not a band score, but per category on the IELTS exam. And it has to be the general IELTS exam. General IELTS exam, minimum of six on each four categories. Yes. I do want okay. to extract that in. I wouldn't go for the minimum. If I'm applying, I want to go uh, with the highest uh, points. That do you, do you have additional points for a higher language score? Exactly. Yes. So the, that's the only thing that you can actually modify. So if I uh, see that I have somewhat of a good profile, but I'm missing some of the language, uh, what I would do is really get into a program, study, and get my, my level of English right. or French higher, or get a second language, English or French. Okay. So that when I can, I can skyrocket my point system. So okay, sure. 
Yeah, you see here in New Zealand, the, uh, the language requirement is, is actually just a, a foundational requirement. You need to have a, an overall score on a general test at least of 6.5 of IELTS or the equivalent of TOEFL or PTE, one of these other tests. So 6.5 overall, it doesn't matter what you've got in each of the different subjects, but it has to be overall 6.5. And that's just a minimum requirement. You don't get points for it. You don't get more points if your score is higher. It's just, you, you have to meet that threshold. Oh, okay, interesting. No, here we're very adamant to say, you can't just have an overall score. Let's right. say if I have 8.5 in writing, but I have a 5.5 in listening, I, right. can, I, you, I don't have the minimum that's required. I okay. have to do the really, really the minimum per category is six. And uh, it, the more I get points, the more points they're going to give me too. So the yeah. score, the higher, the better. Usually okay. 7.5, that's my advice. That's the best. Interesting. And, and you say that there's, there's a really, really a bonus if you can speak French or at least um, have some abilities on the French language. Is that the same yeah. for Canada or just the French provinces? No, so the express entry, great question, David. So express entry is only, only federal. So that means right. that nobody who, like anyone who applies for express entry or through express entry cannot go to Quebec. Right, cannot okay. Go to Quebec because it's a whole different system, right? They select their own people and this is a federal program. So French will help you in your selection process in terms of express entry. It's going to give you a lot more points. So let's say if I am bilingual, if I speak French and English, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my French as my first language uh, on the express entry selection system because they're going to give me extra points. Right uh -huh. now, Canada wants to advocate for bilingualism across Canada outside of Quebec. So whoever speaks French gets more points. Uh, now, if you have both English French, then you can have more points also that way. But I would put the French at first as a first language. All right. Yeah. So let's all go and start learning French. Yeah, French is fun people, and it's sexy people say, I don't know. Okay. Um, so let's talk about PNP. So you asked me about who, what is a PNP. So a provincial nomination, uh, okay. it's, uh, it works with the expert entry program as well. So that means that if I get a provincial nomination, let's say from Ontario, it can be any province, obviously, except Quebec. Quebec will never give you one. They're not in, the, in that system at all. Uh, that's what we always talk about Quebec separately. So let's say... Um, yeah, Ontario selects me, they see my profile on Express Entry Pool and I say, okay, I'm really interested in this candidate, I'm going to send them an, a nomination. So that means that I get 600 extra points. Okay. And what does that mean? You're getting invited. That's 100% right. you're getting invited. There is okay. no question about it. It used to be before that if you had a job offer, they would give you 600 points as well. Uh, I'm not sure why the government decided that that would be idea to change it. Now you only get 60 points, um, so it's not a great advantage, but you still get some extra points. Okay, all right. And, and how does someone go, go about getting that? So it depends on the province. Very, uh, some provinces you can apply directly to them. Uh, yeah. And then like Manitoba, like they have their own se selection system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, BC, also you can go through them. But a lot of the other provinces, they select you from the pool. So like I said, I like this candidate. They have what I need. I want them to come to my province. I'm going to give them a nomination. So I'm going to bring them here. Okay. So the, is it the case that the provinces have their own um, specific criteria or um, um, the, you know, selection criteria related to jobs, occupations, um, or background? Or is, is that how it works? Uh, well, it depends on what they're looking for. So if uh, it's uh, what we call occupations in demand. So okay. let's say if we're talking about the Atlantic, they're looking for more uh, people that are in agriculture or in different areas like fishery, because that's what they're looking there for sure. them in that province, right? But if we're talking about Ontario, maybe we're talking about IT. Maybe we're talking about, um, you know, in health. Right. I see. It really depends on the province and the needs of the province. We're a very big country and we have very yeah. different needs. Sure. And, and those lists will be updated frequently, like maybe yes, quite. Exactly. So in that case, you would go into very uh, each of the provinces. So if I'm interested in Ontario, I'm going to go into the Ontario provincial nomination um, website. Right. Each province has their own website. And then you'll see, you'll be able to see what they're looking for. I'm looking yeah. for more doctors or nurses or this. Everything is right there. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, New Zealand is trending towards that type of um, model. And I, I believe that New Zealand has been watching Australia very closely with a similar program. They have, because the, obviously Australia has different states, um, um, you know, much like Canada. Um, and and I, I think they may have been looking at the Canadian system as well, because until now, what we have is we have essentially um, two regions. And for, for, for purposes of the policy, and that is Auckland, the greater Auckland region, which is a city of coming up to 2 million people, our main, main city, and then you have the rest of the country. So if you, if you take employment outside of Auckland, you, you get points for that. Um, but now what they're, what they're starting to do is to introduce, um, probably by next year, um, more regional specific um, lists more regional specific requirements for for work visas but what you're talking about is also for residents right for PR yes. not just for work visas oh yeah no this is not for work uh, well you can use it's uh, intended for you to live your life here and you can you're going to be able to work but it's not a work permit you're coming right. into Canada with a permanent residency which means you are like a Canadian citizen in many ways and um, the only things that you know you don't have is the passport you can't vote, uh, you can't work for the government or the military, so very yeah. specific things. And you have a limit of the time, the amount of time that you can leave the country. So sure. it's a maximum of three years. But you once, once you come into the country on that residence permit, you don't have to work in any specific occupation or job? No, no. no. You choose to do what you want. Okay, so the government essentially is taking you on your profile and I guess assuming that you will end up working in some sort of field related to you know what your background is and what they need you for but they're yeah. not going to check up on you and see if you're driving uber or working in a motel absolutely no and i feel uh, in my it's my belief that that is one of the flaws of this system mm -hmm. is that we are bringing in very qualified individuals but we're not giving them any opportunities for integration and right. i talk a lot in my company about integration how do we make this per like this person who's very qualified who has a master's degree yeah. who has everything and in terms of experience they have demonstrated already how do we have this person integrated into society effectively yeah. so they don't feel that they wasted their time they're not doing what they're, they studied so many years for and now they want to go back to whatever they're going to look for a new opportunity because we're, we're not doing our job in integrating so i think that's that's a flaw of the system but yeah oh. essentially you come in you have a permanent residence and you can do whatever you want you okay. can yeah, see, because that integration is, is part of the foundation of our system. Um, I, I learned very early on in my career that immigration officers are, um, you know, told that they should consider somebody's ability to settle in New Zealand. This is part of the requirement, or part of the assessment for, for residents. And so I, I, I teach all my staff the same thing. When we're looking at somebody's profile to assess their eligibility for residence or for a visa, um, besides only looking at the technical eligibility, you need to ask the question, is this the type of person who can actually get a job here, who can actually settle here, who, who can actually you know, become part of the New Zealand society? Because otherwise what happens is people will often spend years trying to get to that magical ticket of residence and it just won't work out for them for various reasons, such as you know, their own um, you know, abilities, profile, you know, the likelihood to get a job even. Mm. Right, exactly. So uh, integration is very important and I believe it's something that you can basically give your client or whoever is coming in as a tool, right? So you're teaching them the way of life wherever you are. So in, in terms of Canada, how do we get a job in Canada? What are we looking for in your yeah. resume? Uh, so it's really, uh, and there, you're going to understand that there's going to be a lot of cultural clashes as well. You're coming from a whole different country. Uh, in many right. ways, right. this is completely new, not only the language, but the way that people live. So living, it's yeah. really, like, yeah, filling that gap and accepting the differences, but also filling that gap in, in allowing and helping these people integrate and be part of the society. So with that in mind, what would you say are the top industries for pathways to get, you know, jobs, residents, a lifestyle in, in Canada? Um, uh, like here in New Zealand, it's it's... You know, I can tell you off the top of my hand what, you know, what the good ones are and what the bad ones are. Um, you know, we've got construction is big for us. Um, construction and you've got IT is reasonably, you know, there's a lot of push towards IT, but properly skilled IT, not, not, not just sort of like someone who fixes phones. Um, you know, we have, um, we have a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of related industries in the construction industry as well. 
right? So techni technical workers, welders, plumbers, this type of thing we really need. Um, and what we don't need are retail managers. Okay, so like people who study like a general business diploma and then look for jobs in hospitality or retail, especially after COVID, now retail, hospitality, tourism, these, these are quite shaky industries. What would, you, what would you say are the good ones and bad ones in Canada? What should people be thinking about if they're saying, okay, I want to go and study in Canada and I want to get towards residence? Um, you know, what, Great what, what would you say? Right, so it depends where you're going and it depends what we want. So if we're talking about permanent residency, uh, it, it's not really industry specific. As long as you have what you need to get the points for express entry, you're okay. You need right. a master's degree, you need the languages, you need this, yeah. you need that. So it's very specific in terms of what levels you need. But you can have, uh, you can have um, a, master a master of music. And yeah, exactly. Music in film, in history, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. As long as you get to the points, they're going to select everyone, let's say 450 and up. So you'll right. be selected, right? Uh, now, it also depends on the age of the person. So if you don't have the age, if you're, it's, it, we're going to have to create a very different path for you, right? So if you're, if you're older than 35 and you don't have a strong language, what is the be next best thing? So then we can go through, okay, I'm going to study. And then, like I said, it, it varies. But in Quebec, for instance, you, it doesn't matter if you, if you, if what you study in Quebec. You can study anything as long as you have one year of experience or now it depends on how long you studied. And from one year to 18 months of experience in, in work, and then you can get your permanent residency as long as you right. speak French, right? But it doesn't matter if you're 35, 40, or 50, you can get it. Okay. So I wouldn't say there's a specific occupation. Now, when it comes to work permit, a lot of uh, small towns, they don't have uh, the labor that they need, the people that they need. So a lot of, uh, for instance, well, there's, um, let's say factory workers, so lower incomes, um, they, they will be very demanded in, in certain uh, areas. Now, that's most, it goes through with the employer. So if the employer is looking for, let's say 10 people in, uh, to come work uh, in the wood industry, for instance, right. they're gonna hire us to find that person. But in that case, they're not looking for a specific profile. It could be someone with a high school degree, right? right as long right. as they're willing to go and live in this town and, and do the work, right? And it's manual work, so you're not going to have a hard time. But also, it could be uh, a different company that they're looking for engineers. But now we're in Quebec and in the different part of Quebec, oh, okay, he's going to need French because he needs to communicate, right? Yeah. So it depends. It really depends on, and we have a very big country, so we have very different needs. And, and you can go so, through So what you're saying then is, um, rather than thinking about because what I'm imagining is somebody who's starting the journey for, journey for study and who has a, a, a mind towards um, living in a country like Canada or New Zealand, rather than thinking about the specific um, subject area, they should really just consider having a high level of qualification. Exactly. And a high level of qualification and planning their time properly so that their, their English or French is high and uh, not wasting time and applying after 35. Really not waste time. It's planning. Planning properly the right way you're gonna yeah. have your points you're gonna get accepted it's it's easy as that right so if we have um let's say um a, a young early 20s um applicant who's living in a country like say india and they're thinking that in the next three to five years they would like to have a chance to to um to be a resident of canada um they could even just go about studying in their home country to the degree of master um and practicing their english and perhaps learning french and they would have a good chance. Is that basically what you're saying? Very good chance. Wow. Exactly. Okay. That's good news for a lot of people, I think. Yeah. As long as also you have that one year work experience minimum. Mm -hmm. so okay. I see. And talking about um, study in other countries. So here in New Zealand, um, we have a system. Um, it's called the NZQA. So the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. It's a government body. And um, if a qualification is not automatically accepted by Immigration New Zealand, where there's a list, right? There's a list of overseas qualifications that are automatically accepted. If it's not, then you will have to go through this um, assessment process with NZQA, where they will, they will give you a report telling you that, you know, in their opinion, um, it's equivalent to a New Zealand level, you know, whatever it is. Um, is there something like that in Canada? Okay, yes, so for express entry, we have what it's called educational assessment or credential assessment. 
And that is being done with five organizations and they have to be the ones that are dis designated by the government. So okay. one of the famous ones is uh, World Education Services. They're all based in Canada. And okay. what they do is basically they take your degrees and they're gonna tell you exactly what those degrees are going to be equivalent in Canada. So if it's a master's degree right. in, in software engineering, they're not really looking at your grades. What they're looking at is that the, the, the classes that you took, sure. they're gonna be doing an assessment. Okay, how much of this actually is a master's degree in this uh, same right. area in Canada? And then they'll give you uh, a certificate saying this is what you have. And you absolutely need this for express entry. Okay, that sounds much the same here. Yes. So, okay. but it, it has nothing to do because a lot of people ask the same question. So, what if I already have my education assessed? Does that mean that I can practice? No, that does not mean that if you're a doctor and you got your education assessed that you can practice as a doctor. That means that they understand that you have a doctor, you know, whatever is a medical degree, right? But if you want to uh, practice in Canada, you have to go to the organization or the organism that takes care of doctors or engineers or this and that. Right. Not, 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 not every occupation is regulated, but wh whichever that it is, you have to go through them directly to be able to practice in Canada. It's not just getting right. an ECA that's going to get you the free ticket to go in and, and work in the sure, yeah. Occupational registration. Um, we, we have the same thing here, obviously. Well, every country has the registration requirements for certain occupations. And actually, interestingly enough, um, Immigration New Zealand have recently rejigged their um, priority criteria for residents. And if you are applying for residence based on a job that requires occupational registration and you have occupational registration, um, then you go straight to the front of the queue and we are seeing applications getting approved within two or three months, whereas other applications are taking at the moment up to two years. Oh, wow. Yeah, purely by measure of being um, um, registered in your occupation. The other criteria for priority is high salaries. So if you have a salary that is the equivalent or more of 200% of the median national income, which which is currently so the median national income is currently twenty five dollars and fifty cents New Zealand dollars. Um, I don't know what that is in Canadian dollars. Maybe just slightly less. Um, yeah, so yeah, right. if you have if you have fifty one dollars per hour, you're going straight to the front of the queue. So show oh. me them. <laughs> so what I hear that when you say that is that basically they're talking that's integration right there. They want to make sure that you're going to be able to to work and live in the country. That's right, and and they're saying that so one of one of the uh, one of the, the expressions they use in, in, um, in the government, you know, when they talk about immigration is getting the balance right, getting the mix right, right? So, you know, obviously you have a certain number as your target of how many people you'd like to, to come into the country. Um, we, you know, we do have a net positive migration in New Zealand. They just want to keep that at a certain level. They don't want to let too many people. And so, but anyway, um, you know, you set your policy and then you look at what happens for the next two years or one year. And obviously if too many people come at, 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 you know, as retail managers or hospitality managers, well, you need to do something to change that so that you can attract more master's degrees, IT professionals, you know, regional skilled workers, that kind of thing. It's all about getting the mix right. And, and, and essentially what they're doing now, or the trend, is to say that, um, you know, look, we want highly paid people. We want your tax dollars. We, we, want, we want migrants who are in those, you know, I, I guess in a sense it's like, um, the, the government feels like, okay, if we are a high quality country, then we want to attract high quality people to help in, improve our maybe average IQ, average salaries, average um, GDP, all of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. it does make sense in, in some respects. In other respects, though, it's dangerous. And um, what, what we see is in some communities, whenever there's a, an increase in the requirement of salary, suddenly there's an increase in the amount of fraud um, in, in respect of like what we call a wage recycling scheme. So, uh, you know, it's, it's imagine the scenario like this. Um, applicant says to the employer, um, hey, look, I need $25.50 to get my visa now. And the employer says, oh, I can't afford to pay you that much. How about I pay you $20 per hour? Well, how about I pay you $25.50, but you pay me back $5.50 in cash? And, and so, you know, this, this has always happened and it's always going to happen. But now, now that there's such an incentive to do it, um, it, it, the fear is that it can happen more and more. And because if you have 2550, as of yesterday, this is a new policy, right? 
if you have 2550, you get three years work visa. If you have less than 2550, it's now only six months. Previously, it was one year. So if you're stuck having to apply for a visa every six months, what are you going to do? Maybe talk to your boss and say, hey, can you give me 2550 now? Um, and the boss, if they're, not, if they're not prepared to do it, I think some people are just desperate enough to enter into a fraudulent arrangement. So, David, how do you get a work visa? Like if I wanted to go work in New Zealand and I want to get, let's say I get a job at 2550, how do I just renew my, I'm not sure because we don't work the same way. So I'm not it's, sure. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. So let's say um, Vanessa Cortez contacts David Fisher and says, Hey, look, I'd like to go and work in New Zealand. And, and, and I say, okay, cool. Um, who are you? What do you do? And you show me your resume, your CV. And I, I, I would take one look and I say, Oh, okay. Um, you're uh, uh, an immigration consultant, okay? Or, or you know, you have some legal training or legal experience in the immigration sphere. Um, but here in New Zealand, to do that, you have to be licensed. You have to hold one of these, right? So you wouldn't be able to do that job. Um, but you've also got experience as your own, um, you know, business manager. You're running your own business. So, so looking at that whole profile, I would say to you, okay, um, you know, you you could find a job here in New Zealand as a, a manager, as somebody who's who's maybe an office manager or a, um, a business manager for some kind of professional business here um, or potentially marketing or something that's related to all of the experience that you've done. You have to be eligible based on the skill requirement for whatever job you apply for. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, let's say you find a job. Okay. Let's say even I offer you a job and I say, okay, Vanessa, I need an office manager. <laughs> I need a practice manager. I need someone to come in and really run my business. Who's got experience with migration. Um, in fact, I could even offer you a job as a Canadian migration agent in my company. Let's just say, okay. um, what I have to do is I have to go and, and advertise that position publicly and prove to immigration New Zealand that I have made a genuine attempt to recruit a local resident or citizen first. Okay. So, um, what that really means in practice is I, I place an ad on, on, you know, one of the common job websites for at least two weeks. And then at the end of that two weeks, I close the advertisement and I screen all the candidates and I, and I, I come up with a report that basically, this is what we call a labor market check. I come up with a report that says what happened. And I would say, okay, look, I, I, I advertised for uh, an office manager. I received 25 applications. Um, 12 of those were people on work visas. So I can discard those. Um, the other 13 were New Zealanders. And out of those 13, um, you know, seven of them didn't have any qualifications or experience. So I couldn't consider them. Um, so that leaves six. Out of those six, I shortlisted them. I contacted them. We interviewed them. And here's the result. And the, the, the key point is, it's not, really the, it's not really an issue about whether or not you're the best candidate. I have to prove that there's no one else who's suitable. Right? Okay. So I'm not, I'm not supposed to hire you unless there's really no one else available. And this is where um, Immigration New Zealand is really trying to head in that direction to focus on the employer, not focus on the applicant. So it's not about that, you know, the fact that you want to get a visa. It's the fact that I want to hire someone. Okay. So um, in the past, that's been quite straightforward. Um, and generally for most positions, we can, we can go through that labor market check. After COVID-19, you know, there've been a lot of redundancies. Thousands of people have lost their jobs and it's been a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about going through that, that process. Right, but if I can renew my own visa, so you can't you can't renew a visa. There's, now this is a common misconception here in New Zealand. There's no such thing as renewing a visa or extending a visa. You can only apply for a new visa, and you have to be eligible for the visa again. So yeah, if, you, yeah, if you're already in the job, and this is a little bit antithetical to logic because if if I've given you a permanent employment agreement, um, and then you want to renew your visa or apply again, I have to go ahead and advertise that position again and again interview people and prove that I can't find a New Zealander to replace you first. Oh, you have to do the full thing again. Oh, okay. Right. So that's that's under the main most common visa category, which is we call it essential skills. Um, that they, they change the names every now and then and there's there's some changes coming up to that. But generally speaking, those types of work visas require the labor market check. Now there are some visas that don't require that. For example, if you have a job which is in one of those skill shortage um, categories, um, and if you meet the specific requirements for that job. For example, if you're a chef 
And if you have an offer of employment um, that meets the normal salary requirements, and if you have five years experience, including at least a portion of experience as at, at the level of a chef de partie or higher, and if you have a minimum of a, a what we call a level four certificate of New Zealand cookery, um, then you can apply for that visa. The labor market check is not required. So there's the, there's a you list a of, job. sorry? But you need a job offer. You still need the job offer, yeah. The only way that you can apply for a work visa without a job offer is if you are, um, if you've studied here and it's your post-study work visa, you get an open visa. Or if you have a partner who is either a New Zealand citizen, resident, or, or an eligible work visa holder. Um, okay. Or there is there are a couple of other categories. They're, you know, sort of unique to um, um, uh, whether you've applied for residence or eligible for residence. There's a there's a kind of a, like a, a job search category if you meet the requirements for residence, but you haven't got the job offer yet. And then you get you get an open visa for nine months and then you've got to come here and find the job and then you would get your residence. But that's not so common. The most common is is the visa that requires this advertising and labor market check. OK, so we have the same thing. A lot of people come to me and or send us emails. Uh, I want a work visa. I want a work visa. And it's basically what we tell them all the time. You need a job offer. And usually yeah. what you're going to need is a labor labor market impact assessment, which is the same thing as a yeah. labor check. Is that what they call it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Labor market test okay. check. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. Now for us, we have to advertise for four weeks. And okay. uh, they've advertised the whole process. It has to stay on uh, on the websites uh, the whole time. And, uh, so yeah, we have very specific, it depends on, on the level of skill. So we have high, uh, high wage. Uh, low wage or semi-skill wage. So it really depends on the person, and okay. Canada would have the, the company would have to respect the minimum wage for that occupation, not just right. for. So they have to pay them what they would pay a Canadian. Sure, um, sure, market right. Exactly, and there are a lot of uh, occupations, or there are different ways to get a, a job, a work visa without labor market opinion. But that's uh, it has to be very specific. Like if you speak French, sure. very like yeah. really case by case, it's possible, but it's not the the most easiest. Like the, usually, the, the employer will do the whole part, and uh, and then once it's uh, approved, the person who is hired, they're able to get the the work permit. Okay. Yeah, it sounds sounds similar. I guess there's just a few little details that are, are different. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, look, um, I think we should leave it there. We don't want to go on too long. Our, our viewers um, often um, log out after the first 20 minutes anyway, but what, um, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put your, your company details in the, in the link below. And um, so anybody who's out there who's watching this, who wants to get in touch with Vanessa, um, click the link that we're going to put in the description below, get in touch with her directly. If anyone's here in New Zealand or any of our clients who, who want to, to, to look at moving to Canada, um, feel free to give us a call as well. We can we can always help to liaise with Vanessa and her team. All right. So thank you very much, thank you very much everyone for watching us today. And if you do have questions for us, we'll be right here for you. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. We'll catch up next time. Thank you. Bye bye.